Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. I would like to welcome you to the TRT World Forum Digital Debate. Today we are going to look at what's going, what's what's happening in uh, Palestine, in uh, Israel, with regard to the uh, Jerusalem, uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa, uh, and the uh, violence that erupted and demonstrations as well. Uh, today, uh, I have got an expert on these issues, Dr. Azam Tamimi. He is a British Palestinian academic and also political activist. He is currently the chairman of the Al Hwar TV channel and its uh, editor in chief. He has written on Middle Eastern affairs, uh, uh, including uh, a number of books. One of the books' title is Power Sharing Islam, Islam and Secularism in the Middle East. And uh, he also wrote a book on Rashid El Ghanoushi, Democrat within Islamism and Hamas, a history from within. Uh, Dr. Azam, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to host you here. Let's start with the with a question, a general question, looking at the background of the events that are unfolding these days. What are the main reasons that the you know Palestinians went onto the streets for protest and then now Israel is now using a lot of, uh, I think, violence uh, against uh, uh, the people. What are the main reasons? Is it only the uh, reason Sheikh Jarrah or some other reasons can be also added to this? Well, there has uh, really rarely been an occasion when the Palestinians were not persecuted by uh, Israelis uh, since Israel was created in Palestine in 1948. Yet if we are talking about the current events, I think what triggered uh, these uh, uh, events uh, ha has been the shift within uh, the Israeli mindset toward the right, toward the religious right. You see, the Israelis, from the beginning, Zionists came uh, claiming uh, that this was their ancestral land, that God gave them a divine sort of promise, uh, that uh, even justified dispossessing the Palestinians and persecuting them to force them uh, out of the land. But throughout many years, the Israeli, the, the Zionists were secular leftists, mostly, uh, who were to a certain extent uh, pragmatists in their approach. Uh, and this is what uh, uh, came to fruition uh, in 1993 with the Oslo Accords. Uh, for, for example. Yet what we saw afterwards was a shift toward the right and the empowerment of certain groups who mix uh, their uh, religiosity with their uh, Zionist ideology. Uh, and, and, and these guys uh, have no room for uh, uh, discussing things, for talking things over, for negotiating. Uh, and they openly uh, want Al-Aqsa to be uh, destroyed so that they can establish uh, their alleged uh, temple. They want to remove the Palestinians from, the, from Jerusalem quarter by quarter, street by street, so as to flood it with uh, Jewish uh, settlers. And uh, with Netanyahu in power for so many years, and because it seemed to serve his personal interests and to keep him in power, he entered into an alliance with these guys. And uh, I've just been reading uh, an article uh, by, uh, by uh, an Israeli respectable journalist, uh, UC Melman, who uh, actually spoke about some of the details of what happened recently. They appointed a new police chief who belongs to these groups, to these extremists, and he was the one who uh, triggered the crisis uh, by uh, setting up a, a barricade uh, in the uh, plaza uh, that is uh, right opposite to Damascus Gate, um, and uh, de denying the Palestinian youth uh, uh, an area that they were used to meet uh, every day after iftar uh, uh, at night. It became apparent to this new generation of Palestinians that no matter how much you concede, no matter how much you are willing to coexist with these Zionists, eventually they want you out of the uh, out of the place. They want to take your home, and they want to take your mosque, and this is what led to what we are in now. Right, Doctor Azam, thank you very much for this initial response, and uh, I just would like to raise uh, the impact of this event that are uh, that, that is unfolding. Now it started maybe in a small neighborhood, but then it led to the uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, compound, as we have seen, and then other cities as well. 
and then there is a response from the uh, Hamas side as well. So it seems that the uh, protests and the violence and the clashes are sp spiraling out of uh, one uh, city. What would be the uh, general impact on the Palestinians uh, and uh, in particular, but in general for the region as well? Well, materially speaking, the Palestinians are on uh, on the, uh, the receiving side of heavy blows from the Israelis. The Israelis uh, have a mighty uh, military power uh, that Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the other factions are no match to it. However, on the moral level, uh, this has united the Palestinians like never before. Palestinians from 1948 who are supposed to, supposed, supposed to be Israeli citizens, but actually second-class citizens, if not third, uh, the Palestinians of uh, Jerusalem, who are Palis who are residents, but not citizens, the Palestinians of the West Bank, the Palestinians of Gaza, and the Palestinian diaspora. diaspora, diaspora. The significance here is that this escalation comes after the Palestinians have tried over the past 30 years peacemaking with Israel like never before. The Oslo Accords and what resulted from them since they signed the accords in September 1993 uh, in the White House loan. The Israelis have been taking more land, have been expanding settlements, have been persecuting Palestinians, have been evicting more of them, have been doing all this, the, the things that probably they didn't dare do before. And that is because they have a Palestinian authority based in Ramallah that provides Israel with a security arm. The Palestinian Authority's main function is to coordinate security matters with the Israeli intelligence and therefore shackle the Palestinians in the West Bank and prevent them from protesting in any way against Israeli atrocities. And I think today you won't find a single Palestinian, whether young or old, men or women, who do not see this very clearly. This is the significance of what's happening at the moment. Well, now, as you have mentioned, Oslo uh, Accords and some of the other initiatives that have actually failed to produce a sustainable solution to the Palestinian issue. In your view, do you think the Western powers who are really influential in international, let's say, uh, field, international relations, are they interested in really finding a solution to the uh, Palestinian issue? Well, they are interested in bringing the conflict to an end, but they are not interested in justice, and that's the problem. They want to bring the conflict to an end without serving justice to the victims. Uh, and uh, they are hypocritical about this. They, uh, they keep expressing concern. Oh, we are concerned about what's going on. They are concerned about what? About the flesh of Palestinian children being cut into pieces with uh, American-made weapons given to the Israelis? Are they worried about our uh, first Qibla and third holiest mosque being desecrated day and night by their troops and by, by their policemen? Are they worried about the uh, human rights violations against the Palestinians? No, they are concerned whenever there is a threat to Israel. Why? Because the Zionist project is the Western project in the beginning. It is the Western powers that won the First World War that created Israel afterwards. Of course, they created it after the Second World War, but they were the ones who wanted to solve their Jewish problem at somebody else's expense. So they brought them to us and they enabled them to take our homes. And every Palestinian can tell you stories about his mother, my mother, my father, my grandparents. Every Palestinian will tell you stories about how these guys came invading us and evicted us and persecuted us. So the Western world is, is hypocritical. We don't believe, probably at, at one stage, some people uh, had, had illusions about what America or uh, the European Union uh, could do. But today, no more, no more. Israel, America, and the European Union are all allied against the Palestinians. It's just different language, different discourse because everyone wants to look nice in front of their public. They want to look beautiful in front of the world, world public opinion, uh, paying lip service. But let's talk about the real issue. What is the crisis? What is the, the real problem in Palestine? The real problem is occupation. The 
don't dare talk about occupation. They talk about violence, as if the Palestinians are the cause of the violence. They talk about, they talk about extremists, as if the Palestinians are the only extremists. The real problem is that my mother was thrown out of her house. My father was denied the right to return to his land. I am denied the right to return to my homeland. This is the problem. Right. Now, I think uh, this is also something to do with the political discourse and rhetoric. And you have just, I think, underlined that there is a dominant Western political rhetoric and also that runs in the media as well, that they are concentrating on the protests and clashes and they are always blaming the Palestinians. They are not looking at the root causes. How this issue, current uh, issue, is covered in the Western media? Because I have been looking at some of the mainstream Western media, and I see the same stuff going on. I mean, they never look at the causes and origins of the problem, but they are just looking at, you know, how rockets are now uh, being fired on the on the Israelis. You know, I know I know several people who work in the international media, and we have, we've been friends, and uh, I know that deep within them, they sympathize with the Palestinians. They know that the Palestinians are victims, but most of them don't dare speak a word live on radio or television or write uh, uh, an article about this. They would be thrown out of the institution, they would be sacked, they would lose their jobs. And we know of several cases of people who spoke, who dared speak, and as a result, they lost their jobs. Unfortunately, the media institutions in the West, which they, they, which they claim to be liberal, they claim to be defenders of freedom of speech, when it comes to Palestine, there is no freedom of speech. When it comes to Palestine, there is only one concern. Don't anger the Zionists and their supporters. Otherwise, you will lose sponsorship. You will lose advertising. You will lose this. You will have MPs in parliament or members of Congress uh, uh, coming after you. So people are intimidated. This is the problem in the West. Well, there is an argument that especially U.S. can exert some sort of uh, power on Israelis and maybe they can be the less more influential mediator. Uh, what is your expectations from the Biden administration? It, you know, during the Trump administration, we have seen that, you know, things were was in favor of Israel and uh, Jerusalem, Al-Quds was made uh, the capital and they uh, moved their um, uh, embassy there. Do you think there will be a change or uh, how things will uh, develop under Biden's administration? I think Biden is in an unenviable position. He hates uh, Netanyahu's guts. They never get along well. But at the same time, he once proclaimed himself to be a Zionist, a defender of Israel, to the extent that he said that if Israel didn't exist, the United States of America would have uh, had to invent it. I and mean, imagine, but at the same time, he can see what Netanyahu is doing. Netanyahu is damaging U.S. interests, actually. Uh, but uh, Biden, uh, in my opinion, would be careful to uh, take any serious steps. There's another problem here, and, and that is the lack of leadership in the Arab world. When I compare what's going on at the moment with what happened in 2012 when Israel attacked Gaza, there was a great man in Cairo. There was a noble man in Cairo, a real hero, Muhammad Morsi, rahmatullah alayhi. He stood and said to the Americans and to the Israelis, we will not allow you to do this to Gaza. Immediately, Barack Obama dispatched Hillary Clinton to him. And within hours, they stopped the Israeli attack on Gaza. There are no men in Arab capitals today. They are all cowards. They are all hypocrites. Probably were a, a few <laughs> here and there just to... Uh, who are trying to help, but they are weak. They are unable to do. But most of them, most of them collaborate with the Zionists. Look at the people who uh, signed the Abraham Accords. Lousy Arabs, they do not represent any of the Arab nations they are ruling. They don't represent anybody. The, 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 the king of Morocco doesn't represent the Moroccans. The military junta in Sudan does not represent the Sudanese people. The ruler of Abu Dhabi does not represent the UAE people. And the king of Bahrain doesn't represent the Bahraini people. And I know this for sure. I know that the people, the Arab peoples, have fire raging within themselves. They want to do something about Gaza. But all these Arab armies and security agencies and police uh, establishments or institutions are there in order to restrict the ability of the Arab masses to say a word, let alone to, to, to come up with an action. 
Well, actually, I was going to raise this Abraham Accord, this you know famous or so-called uh, famous uh, agreement that some of the Arab states have signed with Israel in order to normalize the relations between the Arab world and Israel. And I remember that in the beginning, they were all talking about that this agreement would uh, be in favor of uh, Palestinians. They were never talking about other issues, but it seems that Israel had more leverage these days despite the fact that there was such an agreement, but those who countries signed agreement, they do not also, I think, raise uh, strong voices against uh, the Israeli government uh, in the face of uh, the current crisis. We were never under illusion that the Abraham Accords were in favor of Zionism and not of uh, the Arabs or the Muslims. But I'll tell you why they went and signed the Abraham Accords. The regimes, uh, that stood against the Arab Spring, that financed the coup against democracy in Egypt, and that continue to disrupt the democratic process in Tunisia, in Libya, and wage war in Yemen. They are the ones who seized the opportunity of the existence of a madman in the White House, uh, Trump, and they entered into an an unholy alliance with Zionism against the Arab masses. The Abraham Accords is a Zionist camp against the Arab masses. See, there is a direct link between the struggle for the liberation of Palestine and the struggle for the liberation of the human being in the Arab world. They go hand in hand. It seems that you are not very uh, optimistic about the Arab governments in the region to tackle the issue effectively. And I think given the history, I think uh, you have uh, some right in, in uh, thinking uh, like that. Now, I just would like to look at other, you know, uh, organizations or dimensions of the issue. You said, you know, you do not expect a lot from the, you know, United, United, United uh, uh, US because uh, of the continuation of the, uh, you know, policies towards uh, Israel, they have been always, favoring Israel vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, I think, the Arab world. But, you know, there is UN, there is um, the Arab, Arab League, uh, and finally, OIC. 57 member states are there. And when you look at their economy, when you look at their, you know, uh, military, uh, when, they, uh, when you look at their demographic profile, I mean, we are talking about 1.8 billion uh, Muslims. Do you think uh, there is some sort of opportunity, given the failure of other uh, organizations, that OIC can take lead? And what could be the lead, lead that uh, this organization can take? Well, OIC is plagued with differences within it. It's a, it's a platform for, um, uh, for states, for governments. Most of the members of this organization, like almost most of the members of the Arab League, are undemocratic governments. They are governments that are not elected by the people. They represent uh, minorities who are powerful, who are resourceful, or who are supported by certain regional or international powers. So actually, they, they don't have us in their mind. They don't think about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa or Gaza or the poor Palestinians or the poor Yemenis or the poor Syrians or the poor Libyans. They don't have this in their mind. So uh, yes, uh, it's it's a club of governments that don't represent their peoples. I mean, as for the uh, UN, uh, we've had a, 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 a very long experience with the UN. The UN was the institution that recognized the creation of Israel in our homeland. The United Nations, with all its institutions, is crippled by the veto system that was. Uh, uh, made central uh, to the Security Council and to its uh, mechanism. It never works, but that doesn't mean I'm not optimistic. I am optimistic because I can see the, the new generation of Palestinians, the new generation of Arab and Muslim young men and women. They are the hope. They are the ones who are going to bring about change, but not these governments. But what I meant to say earlier is that if we want to liberate Palestine, we need to liberate the human being in the Arab and Muslim world. And without freedom, we can never achieve that. We need freedom. And the way to freedom is to get rid of these imposed regimes and uh, have them replaced by elected ones that are accountable to us.
Without this, there will never be uh, a breakthrough. Right, uh, Dr. Razam, I think there is a difference between the Arab League and the OIC. The Arab League is, uh, you know, more uh, uh, among, among the Arab countries, you know, purely uh, Arab countries are members of the Arab Union. But OIC is, yes, it is the governmental organization, but, you know, there are non-Arab uh, countries involved in this uh, organization. And I think they are also pressing that this organization should be more active in raising the issue and bringing solutions, etc. Turkey might be one of them, and there are some other countries as well. Do you think that this might be some sort of a new opening that you know countries like Turkey can push the uh, OIC a little bit further? I'm sure Turkey is trying, but the, the, the problem is there are, there are major obstacles. Uh, the OIC was set up after uh, the attempt to burn down Al-Aqsa Mosque in the late 60s. What has it done since then? Even if there are well-intentioned people within it, Saudi Arabia will not allow uh, uh, anything good to happen. And Saudi Arabia is a very resourceful because it's a founder. It's a founder member of the of the, of the OIC. Uh, this is the problem. Are we going to have? Uh, I mean, uh, would these countries be willing to have a, a quarrel among themselves because of Palestine? Of course not. They have their own problems. They have their own priorities. They have their own concerns. Uh, and therefore, unless you have a majority mem of members who see eye to eye on these important issues, it will continue to be a waste of time, unfortunately. Then what are the options? I mean, yes, if we run out of uh, options, you say uh, US uh, is not there to help. EU also is not there. And this is a Western project anyway, you know, the establishment of Israel. And uh, what is left? For, for oh. the Palestinians. Oh, what, what is left is a lot. What is left is the people, the human being. I mean, look, look at Gaza. Gaza is under siege, under siege from Israel, under siege from Egypt, and under siege from the Palestinian Authority. And Gaza is causing so much headache for Zionism and for Israel. I mean, this is promising, isn't it? Look at the youth in Al-Aqsa Mosque. They didn't even have a knife in their hands, nothing. Nothing in there, and they stood to the heavily armed Israeli uh, soldiers uh, and policemen. If you believe you have a right and you are willing to make sacrifices for it, eventually you will win. This is what gives me optimism. This is what gives me hope. But I'm not going to uh, uh, delude myself into hoping uh, in some uh, useless uh, institutions here and there. Right. I think uh, you have emphasized the youth and the uh, power of uh, human beings and the Palestinians. You know, uh, in, in history, we have seen two big, let's say, uh, rising of the Palestinians uh, called Intifada, the first Intifada and the second Intifada. Do you think this issue might lead to a third Intifada involving, you know, many Palestinians, uh, also, you know, Arab citizens who are living in uh, uh, under, under uh, Israeli uh, uh, Israel as well. I think we are seeing signs of this. And now whether it de develops further or not, Allahu A'lam, but we are seeing signs of this. I mean, who could have imagined a month ago, only a month ago, that a city like Lud would be under curfew and that the Israeli authorities would order all set Jewish settlers out of the city in order to be able to tackle the Palestinians. Uh, in Umm al-Fahm, these are towns and cities in 1948 Palestine. The youth last night and the night before and the night before, every night they're battling the policemen and the, and the, and the soldiers uh, on their streets. Uh, yes, we are seeing signs. One major obstacle from turning this into a full-fledged intifada is the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. Because the Palestinian Authority is empowered only to guard over the Palestinians and prevent them from doing anything. And this is regrettable, but I am uh, hopeful that uh, an increasing number of Palestinians are seeing this uh, for what it is, and hopefully they will do something about it. Now you have uh, made, I think, several references to young people, and I think one should also look at the new uh, opportunities for them, like the social media, the power of civil society, and also now, also, we see that there's a lot of international, I think, support to the Palestinian cause, 
uh, we can see it in the uh, you know conventional media also in the in the social media especially coming from the muslim world what is your uh, view on the power of the social media in dissemination of palestinian views and how they organize themselves well, we're seeing we're seeing that power reveal itself. I mean, uh, who brought us all these messages and all these video clips from Al Aqsa Mosque when the Israelis were besieging it and were storming it? It's these young men and women who were on social media, uh, working hard in order to tell the world what's going on. And yes, definitely, the social media is playing a very important role. But of course, regrettably. Uh, some governments are intervening in order to curtail the role of the social media when it comes to the Palestinian struggle. But we have to keep to, to keep uh, to keep going. Now, uh, with regard to world support for Palestine, I have no uh, I, I, I don't doubt for a minute that a majority of people around the world sympathize with the Palestinians, even in Europe and probably even in America. It is just that the, these governments who are so resourceful and so powerful are manipulating the media, are using it, and are using their power, military, political, as well as economic, in order to silence the supporters of Palestine, such as what the uh, uh, British Parliament is doing at the moment. The British Parliament is working on a bill, a draft law, that would incriminate B B D I S uh, BDS, the uh, famous uh, uh, global movement for boycotting Israel. Imagine when governments do this, they incriminate their own citizens for simply saying Israel is committing war crimes against the Palestinians and we don't want to buy its products. And this becomes a crime. In America, some states have adopted this. But when it comes to the students, when it comes to the youth, when it comes to civil society institutions, there is an overwhelming shift uh, uh, in favor of Palestine and the Palestinians. Uh, Azam, as uh, you have mentioned, I think uh, there is a lot of potential uh, in uh, in Israel, in in the neighboring countries, in Palestine. But there is also, a, you know, maybe it's not in big numbers, uh, demographically speaking. But when you look at their impact, they can make an impact. The Christian minority. Who are also suffering, in, especially in the in East uh, Jerusalem? What could be their role, and to what extent they are involved so far in supporting the Palestinian case? Well, the Christians of Palestine are are as as victims of uh, Zionism as the Muslims. There is no distinction. We never, I mean, we never make a distinction between a, a Palestinian Christian uh, and uh, a Muslim, a Palestinian, a Palestinian Muslim. Uh, their churches are under threat. Uh, their houses are under threat. The Zionists, they don't, they don't make a distinction between uh, a Muslim and a Christian when, when it comes to, uh, to Palestinians. And in the mosque, by the way, in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, there were many Christians who came to express support and solidarity, and they were with their brothers and sisters who were uh, performing atikaf in the mosque. I think that should be uh, made uh, public to the whole world that, that there's a, a you know solidarity between Muslims and Christians uh, of all sorts in order to uh, stand against the aggression of the uh, Zionists in in Palestine. Now, my last question is about the future, of course. Uh, where does the Palestinian struggle go from here? As you have said, there is Ramallah, there is Hamas, there is another group. So the lead, there is no single re leadership. Uh, you know, what could be the role of leaders and how do you think they can come together if they can, that they can represent Palestinians in, in one single uh, powerful voice? A unity of leadership has to be based on a unity of vision. We Palestinians have always been divided, by the way. It's not new that we are divided. We've always been divided because there were different convictions among different uh, elites. But I think increasingly, we are coming to one vision, and that vision is that coexistence with Zionism in Palestine is being made impossible by the Zionists, not by us. Because they're, they're saying to us, we want your mosque, we want your church, we want your house, we want your street. You have no place here because God gave the entire land to us. Now, how do you deal with this? You cannot compromise. You cannot, you cannot reach a compromise with someone who believes God gave them your house. What can you do? You have to defend yourself. And I think we are heading in that direction. 
Uh, in uh, the early 90s, there were some confusions because of the late Yasser Arafat and his uh, uh, gamble of going uh, through with the peace process, which he later on uh, regretted and lamented and paid with his life uh, for it. But now I think an increasing number of Palestinians can see that these guys came to us, they invaded us, and they will never let us even live on part of the land, let alone on all of our land. Thank you very much, Azam Tamimi. Thank you for joining us, TRT World Forum Digital Debates. Today we have covered a number of issues regarding Palestine, and I think we have also looked at history, uh, at what's going on now, and the uh, prospects for the future. Thank you very much, and I would like to say goodbye to everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, and Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.